Hi, I'm Brian, and I'm going to go over this 2003 Silverado. It's got the dual climate controls with the manual temperature control as opposed to the automatic. And there's four actuators for the HVAC, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning units. I'm going to show you where those are located. Well, it's going to be a little bit, little bit longer video. It's going to help a lot of people. So that's what I'm looking for. That's my goal. Uh, but for the people that just want the cut and dry, quick and dirty, uh, answers. I'm just going to go over those for you right now. So on this vehicle there are four actuators. There's one actuator that controls the mode and it's located down by the pedals. If you look to the up and right of the accelerator pedal you'll find an actuator right in there. You can see it. This is what an actuator looks like. This is an aftermarket actuator and you'll see that this is a mode door. It'll either be a mode door or a blend door because it has the position sensor on it. It's got five pins, uh, whereas the Recirc one only has three. We'll get into that in just a minute. The one for the driver's side temperature control for the hot and the cold temperature or blend door actuator is right down underneath of here. It's stuck up on the bottom, so you got to pull that pan underneath uh, to get to it and it's mounted in this position and you'll either have two screws one here and here here usually that's just an alignment pin these are the actuators they move the doors let's show you what that looks like uh, in motion on this temperature door this one uh, is on the top of the hvac box so this one is on the opposite side of where it is on the control it's down here this one is on the opposite side it's down there and then this one is up on the top. Uh, this blend door or temperature door uh, and you'll notice the shape of this right here. You can hear the little door opening and closing. So on the one side you have a heater core and on the other side you have an evaporator core. One's for the air conditioning, the cold, and another one's for the heat, the hot. So, And then uh, the fourth one you can see is still mounted in the vehicle here. This actuator it's got the two bolts and the connector. Uh, controls this door right here, and this is the recirc door or the inlet door. So this is where air comes into the HVAC system, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. So the air comes in here, and then it'll either blow across uh, the heater core or the evaporator, the hot or the cold, and then that door, um, and this one, like I say, is for the passenger side. When you go to unplug the electrical connector from these, you need to bear in mind, this is not a Chrysler product. You do not need to pull the red tab out. That red tab retains the pins within the plug. Um, all that's needed is you push down on the back side and then pull back. It's very easy to unplug. Let's talk about mounting these things. When you get them, you'll notice that they are keyed up or aligned in this fashion and you can see that this socket the circle with the little edges taken off top and bottom it lines up pretty much with the bolts more or less close enough when you look at this your air dam in the position that it failed in is variable it could be any of these positions and that won't work that won't work but if you get this to line up with the bolts there's a pretty good chance it's going to work now on this one the wiring is situated like this or like this naturally from the factory it's like this I like to run it like that just because I'm a little bit of a control freak and I don't want to risk having something pinched or be stuck underneath is that dumb I don't know uh, so basically this is oriented so that it's in the middle of its throw there's a little limiter on the inside of the newer ones you can actually see it on the other ones as I've mentioned elsewhere in the video uh, but it's basically oriented in the middle so they can go all the way one way or the other. So we've got a pin here to align with. We have two holes for our bolts and then we have a plug. It's important that you refrain from plugging it in until it's screwed down. Screw it down first um, and then once it's screwed down you can plug this in pretty much any time after that. But you want the key off and you want this unplugged while this is being screwed in. You don't want any power getting in there and moving it, especially if you go with the aftermarket ones such as a Dorman product or some other aftermarket thing. So the last actuator on this system of four actuators is on the driver's side down by the pedals. Now I've already removed the duct work that goes with this. There's a short duct that goes across the top here and were it in place I wouldn't be able to show you anything. With it removed, 
if I get around the wires and stuff, you can see the plug that goes to the actuators there. And then you look up here and there's kind of a wheel thing. You can see that it has a centralized hub and that's where the socket of the actuator interfaces. And you look at it, you've got the two bolts that go onto it. Um, and of course the top one or whatever's farthest away is going to be a little difficult. This is where that duct goes that would block access to it. But that wheel actually turns different knobs. You have a knob there on the left that you can see, and then there's another one on this side on the right. And that wheel, you can see that it's got channels or tracks that it moves in, and that causes each of those levers to move and change those different air dams to send it to defrost or vent or wherever it needs to go. So this is the puck that goes to the mode door. I call it a puck, I don't know what else to call it, some kind of radial something. So it pivots here, you can see I'm getting low on grease, so I've got to pull it out and grease it. One of your bolt pegs goes through here, and then there's three different uh, things. This one's the one that goes in this track, so it's going to be oriented clear up in here somewhere because the weight of the door falls down and puts it up there. So you have to reach up, hook it onto that one first. Um, this one's easy to see in a line. This one's a little elusive, but there's three. You can see three tracks, three bars and then the post that you bolt to. Then index this onto this circle that it wants to go onto. Once that's all in, it'll just sit on its own, and then you just rotate it until this is in alignment. So you're gonna align it so that your mounting bolts line up in a straight line with where that is, like that. So you can get an idea of where this one needs to be. It looks like it's about in the center of it, like that, across that line. And then your other one's gonna be on this side. So you're in a line here and you're in a line there, but it's under the dash, so good luck with the orientation. I'm gonna go around and get a little bit of this on the surfaces of everything that moves, just so that I have a nice smooth working surface. If this is hanging up or dragging, it's gonna create all kinds of havoc and things will break and fail. It wants to be lubricated. Reduce friction. Um, I've shown you where the actuators are. Getting to them is more simple than you would think. Um, to remove the top portion of the dashboard for doing the recirc and the top one, what I do is remove the handle, and the handle looks like this. Uh, in the installed position, it's like that, and they're actually ratcheting catches, uh, and there's a push button release. To get to the push button release, all that you need to do, see, here's the hole for it. Well, the dashboard will be in place, but these little vents will actually pull out. You just get a plastic knife or a pry bar. I'll put a link in the description for those. But you just get these to pry out, and then once it's out, there's a nylon button that you push. Can you see that? See the little teeth that catch it? So there's one on each side. It takes a little bit of juggling. If you had three hands, it'd be great. You'd have a hand on each button, and a third hand would pull it, or you could grab it with your teeth if you were a dog, but that's how that comes out. So the first things you do, pulling the bezel from the outer part here looks really dramatic, but it's quite simple. There's just these little push tabs that expand. So use your plastic body knife. Around the corners you'll find support. So I start at a corner and just pull it around. You can grab it with your fingernails even and pull it, but it's just this whole big piece that comes off. So you pull that with your body knife, pull both of the vents with your body knife, and then uh, pull the handle. And you have to do that order of operations or it won't work. The next thing you want to do is on these little panels, they work much in the same way. They're just a pressure fit with a little wedge. So where your fuses are, reach under the base, pop that off, and pop the other side off. It'll come off in the same manner and just set them aside. At that point, most everything down here is off that needs to come off. The next thing you do is you'll have two screws that are Phillips here and here. You'll have a screw in each of the vents there and there, and then you'll have two screws on the other side as well. As far as the dashboard, you can see where these fasteners are. There's one here, 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 and so on, going on down the side over here. Once you've pulled those screws, then the dash can pull up and pop off. As far as the front, what about screws in the front of the dash? That's what I was wondering. But there's just a little lever. It's just a little pinch point that slides in. You have to be careful and pull the top part of the dash up and pull it straight back. Because these clips, uh, you can see this should have a clip on it, but it's stuck up here. 
these clips aren't very strong and this plastic is not very strong so it's important to pull straight back so that you don't damage them I had one break and uh, that clip was already broken somebody already glued it back in you can see I didn't mention but you do pull the A pillars there's a little area on the dashboard you can see this little line here the A pillar molding goes over the top of this and kind of traps it in there if you pull the A pillar molding off then that'll clear a lot easier I don't think you can get it if you don't you can see where the handle goes for this um, if you don't pull the handle first. One other thing to mention, you can see on the defrost grills there's a little black button here. That's for the headlight sensors for your automatic headlights. There's a plug on the bottom side of that. You'll want to be careful that you don't rip the wires apart to get that out. So there's a couple, of, there's a fork in the road when it comes to getting this one here. When you get this one, uh, there's a duct that runs over the top of it and you can either do the cut and tape uh, method which I would recommend or you can do the glove box method which is a real pain in the neck um, when you do the glove box method you've got this steel bracing here and it's just really difficult to get your hands or anything in there to get it out on the older models it was more acceptable you could do that but 03 and newer I would recommend doing the cut and tape method um, where you cut it is on the left side of where the fasteners are this needs to be cleaned up. You can't get away with taping it on this or you won't get a good seal. You have to clean all of this with alcohol and then you can use gaffing tape or duct tape. This is literally a duct. This is what duct tape is for. Um, but if you cut it in the wrong place then you won't have access and you won't have support. Everything's got to be supported well. Um, where you cut on this is there's a tab for the defrost that's melted you can see where it's just totally melted on so you just take your sawzall knife and you cut underneath of there this is a milwaukee sawzall knife they're just they're just ridiculously awesome it's like a pocket knife that locks in the open position um, but they're also i mean i'm doing this one-handed you can push in the thing and it just pulls out uses a standard sawzall blade so you want to use the most teeth that you can it'll get a smoother cut on this one I'm using 18 though if you use a wood cutting one you have a longer blade which is convenient and tempting uh, but these cut so much smoother the wood blade if you're too rough it'll split and crack these and you don't want that but I, I start on the rib back here so I'll reach over the top and uh, get back behind there the best I can. Basically you take off the corner just a little bit and then get into the rib this way and then lean it this way and then that way and this way and that way. Go from the other side, meet your cut, trim it up, clean it with alcohol and like I say you don't have to go too crazy on it. You can use duct tape, you can use gaffing tape which works great and it's quiet and dampening as well. Uh, but you just cut that so that you have the access to get into it. Your radio antenna wire clips on all over the place. It's got all these little clips um, and it goes on to the back of this. You can see the little marks where the antenna wire was clipped on here. And then here's another clip that didn't come off but just watch your radio wire. As far as cutting other wires and things in there, it's pretty much just the radio wire. There's really nothing else in there to cut or worry about and there you have it but like i say once you pull that you have all the access that you need it's really easy to get to it's really easy to align everything i can pull all of this off make the cut even with the cleanup even with all of that i can get that done faster going this way and i can ensure that i have a better job and a better install i don't cut corners basically there is a brace that goes over the top of this i don't want to leave you surprised and shocked oh my gosh there's a brace but this is what's going to support everything after it's uh, been cut and taped. You've got support on one end with the screw right here. And then you have support here because I'm going to do a self-tapping screw. The way I cut this is this is a nice, robust, thick piece of plastic. And then this also. You'd think that it would be too thin, uh, but it's not. It's fine. I may get just a teeny tiny bit of a leak there, but I'm really not concerned about it. It won't hurt anything at all. The first time I saw somebody do this uh, cut method, I was like, oh no! <laughs> it reminded me of working at AutoZone Nights and having a gentleman explain that he cut a hole in his fender to get the CV axle out of his car. 
and uh, just just like, oh my gosh, you're hearing people cut the bed of the truck to get the fuel pump out. I was just like, no, don't do that. Uh, cosmetics, it's there's nothing wrong cosmetically. Function wise, it'll work great. It'll function great. Um, what about uh, rattles? You don't want any rattles behind the dash, but because of where we cut it and the way it's supported and the gaffing or duct tape, there's nothing to rattle. It'll be fine. Also, there's a screw that supports this side on the back side here. You can criticize and condemn me for doing this, but it, it does save a lot of time. If you have a better method, please tell us in the comments in a respectful fashion. I've never worked at a Chevy dealership. I've worked on a number of these trucks. I've watched a lot of other videos and this just seems to be the way to go for me, but if there's a better way, let me know. I'd love to know. So doing the cut and tape method, you can see I try to keep my cut as straight as I can, but when you come from two directions, you're going to have them not line up perfectly, but there's an exact match on the other side. Now this was all furry, which is, it's not conducive to getting a good seal to have it all furry from the, the sawing. Basically it just sticks to it, the plastic sawdust as it were. Uh, isn't dust, it's just stuck. I recommend using a razor or a sharp blade to get them off most of the way and then you can go over it with a torch or whatever and just get a real fine clean edge. If you do that, clean it with alcohol and duct tape it, you won't have any problems getting this to seal and it won't be noisy. Any adverse effects from cutting it will be very limited if you clean it up properly. Basically what happens is the shavings getting in the way of the tape sealing flat and once that happens then that creates all kinds of opportunities for leak. Tape is flat, it likes to lay flat, it does a great job sealing flat, but if the stuff's in the way then it creates all kinds of topographical contours that are inconducive to having it seal properly. Now when I say duct tape everybody's thinking about that uh, gray type, but I'm talking literal duct tape, tape that you use on duct work. Um, it's got the peel back and it's kind of gummy. You see it's like pizza cheese. It just really sticks on there. So this has a really good integrity quality to it, but it also has a really good sealing quality. So that's what we've done. I've wrapped the tape around before peeling the adhesive backing to make sure I've got plenty to go around. So you just tape underneath the bottom first and then I'll lay that ductwork in on top of it and then press it and wrap it all the way around the rest of the way. Now before I get too far, I was going to show you, here's the screw that holds that in there. There's a little alignment dowel that holds it in the meantime before your screw goes in. Here's my taping job. I actually murdercated, mutilated this part here. I didn't do very well getting it in without getting in trouble. So I only made it to there. I had to tear this off because it was sticking to itself. It got munched. You can see the rest of it went really well. It's nice and tight. I mean, there's just... This is the way to go, as far as I know. Um, this will get bolted onto here and support it. There'll be another bracket that goes underneath of that even. I'm going to put one more piece across the top. I can reach through underneath and really smush my tape down on the bottom side. Get my arm clear up in there, squeeze it top and bottom. That's not going to leak at all. I mean, a little leak is okay. That's going to be zero. I've got my antenna wire going up and over. I've clipped it on here, here, and here. So it's nice and tight. Nothing's going to rattle. We're just in great shape. Once you hook everything up and turn the key on, you're going to have some calibration going on. So immediately this one closed. It was in the middle position to get the thing on. So this one's gone all the way to the left. It hasn't gone to the right yet. Move it to center. See what that does. It already beat me to it. It's already at center. We're just gonna run through and put it to hot. Put it to hot, it goes to hot. You see it's lining up with the key marks. So there's the middle roundabout. Go past middle, go to the next key mark. You can hear it chirp and calibrate. So that one's good. That, that was our main attraction that we were in here to get. Um, we're going to turn up the fan. We are set to defrost, and that's where this is set. And we just replaced all of these things. So we're going to go to feet. And it should start blowing down there. I'm getting blowing to feet so that's good if you buy the wrong one if you get an automatic instead of a manual controls or something like that then it won't blow to the right location so now we'll go to vent you can see the dust just poofed out of here we're at the vent 
So we've replaced all of the actuators, tested all of them. Looks like they're working pretty good. So the only one I haven't done is the recirc. So we'll press the recirculation button. I already saw it calibrate one way. Now it's going in the other direction. And it stopped okay. So there's their blower motor. You can see that just spinning down there. Hit the recirc button again. And it'll close. So this is the inlet actuator or recirc actuator. Recirc meaning recirculation. Right now it's fresh air. When you open this, it pulls the air from the cab and recirculates the air through the cab. You can see there. Cool. Well, there you go. The only one I haven't tested is this one. I have to get down underneath. So we're set to cold. Go back to hot. It's moving slow, but it's getting there. We're all the way to hot, we'll go back to cold. Looks like it's working pretty well. Cool, well that's our fix. You made it to the end of the video. That says a couple of things about you. For one, you're patient. Uh, two, you want to get all the information that you can. You're, you're primed and ready to learn. That means you're humble. And uh, I'm just impressed. So good for you. Thumbs up. Uh, I make these videos because I care about you. I want you to, you know, I say that generally. That does, you know, I love you. That doesn't mean that I'm going to put up with crap. That doesn't mean that I'm going to want to respond to everything all the time from everybody. Uh, but that just means that generally people in nature are awesome. I love people. I want to help them out. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, if you want to help me out, you can click the thumbs up button. Uh, if you have any questions or comments and you want to help others, feel free to visit the comments and see if you have an answer there. Or maybe you have something that you'd like to provide. Maybe you've got a tip on something on doing one with automatic climate controls. Come on back and uh, contribute. That would be fantastic. I look forward to hearing from you. Cheers.